In this appendix the Commission presents a biography of Jack Ruby. Although criminal proceedings involving its subject are pending in the state of Texas, the Commission has decided to include this rather detailed account of Ruby's life and activities for several reasons. Most importantly, the Commission believes it will permit a better evaluation of the evidence on the question whether Ruby was involved in any conspiracy. Furthermore, the Commission believes that in view of the many rumors concerning Ruby the public interest will be served by an account, which attempts to give sufficient material to provide an impression of his character and background. The Commission's desire not to interfere in the pending proceedings involving Ruby necessarily limits the scope of this appendix, which does not purport to discuss the legal issues raised during Ruby's trial or his possible motive for shooting Oswald. Family Background Jack Ruby Born Jacob Rubenstein, was the fifth of his parents' eight living children. There is much confusion about his exact birth date. School records reported as June 23, April 25, March 13, and, possibly, March 3, 1911. Other early official records list his date of birth as April 21 and April 26, 1911. During his adult life the date Ruby used most frequently was March 25, 1911. His driver's license, seized following his arrest, and his statements to the FBI on November 24, 1963, listed this date. However, the police arrest report for November 24 gave his birth date as March 19, 1911. Since the recording of births was not required in Chicago prior to 1915, Ruby's birth may never have been officially recorded. No substantial conflict exists, however about whether Jack Ruby was born in 1911. Ruby has one older brother and three older sisters. The oldest children, Hyman and Anne, were born shortly after the turn of the century, before their parents arrived in the United States. The other children were born in Chicago. Ruby's sister Marion was born in June 1906 and a sister Eva in March 1909. Ruby also has two younger brothers and a younger sister. Sam was born in December 1912, early in April 1915. The youngest child, Eileen, was born in July 1917. At least one and possibly two other children died during infancy. Jack Ruby's father, Joseph Rubenstein, was born in 1871 in Chisokolov, a small town near Warsaw, Poland, then under the rule of Tsarist Russia. He entered the Russian artillery in 1893. There he learned. The carpentry trade, which had been practiced by his father and at least one brother and he picked up the habit of excessive drinking that was to plague him for the rest of his life. While in the army, he married Jack's mother, Fanny Turek-Rodkowski. The marriage was arranged, as was customary, by a professional matchmaker. According to his oldest son, Joseph Rubenstein served in China, Korea, and Siberia, detesting these places and army life. Eventually. In 1898, he simply walked away from it and about four years later he went to England and Canada, entering the United States in 1903. Settling in Chicago Joseph Rubenstein joined the Carpenters Union in 1904 and remained a member until his death in 1958. Although he worked fairly steadily until 1928, he was unemployed during the last 30 years of his life. The only other group which Joseph Rubenstein joined consisted of fellow immigrants from Sokolov. His daughter Eva described this group as purely social and completely non-political. Jack Ruby's mother, Fanny Rubinstein, was probably born in 1875 near Warsaw, Poland. She followed her husband to the United States in 1904 or 1905, accompanied by her children Hyman and Anne. An illiterate woman, she went to night school in about 1920 to learn how to sign her name. She apparently failed in this endeavor, however for an alien registration form, filed after about 35 years in the United States, was signed by an ex. Although she apparently learned some English, her speech was predominantly Yiddish, the primary language of the Rubenstein household. Still, Mrs. Rubenstein felt strongly that her children required an education in order to better themselves. She frequently argued about this with her husband, who had received little, if any, formal education and firmly believed that grammar school training was sufficient for his children. Childhood and Youth 1911-33 In 1911, when Jack Ruby was born, 
His family resided near 14th and Newberry Streets in Chicago, the first in a series of Jewish neighborhoods in which the Rubensteins lived during his childhood. In 1916, the Rubensteins lived at 1232 Morgan Street, where they apparently remained until 1921. This was the fourth residence in the first five years of Jack Ruby's life. Earl Ruby described one typical neighborhood in which the family lived as a ghetto with push carts on the sirens. His sister Eva characterized it as below the middle class but yet it wasn't the poorest class. The family generally lived near Italian sections, where there were frequent fights along ethnic lines. The Rubenstein home was marked by constant strife and the parents were reported to have occasionally struck each other. Between 1915 and 1921, Joseph Rubenstein was frequently arrested because of disorderly conduct and assault and battery charges, some filed by his wife. In the spring of 1921, Jack Ruby's parents separated. In 1937 Mrs. Rubenstein reported that she had desired a divorce 15 years earlier, but her husband had been opposed to it. The predominant causes of the separation were apparently Joseph Rubenstein's excessive drinking and Fanny Rubenstein's uncontrollable temper. She resented her numerous pregnancies, believed her husband to be unfaithful, and nagged him because he failed to make enough money. Psychiatric Report Young Jack soon showed the effects of parental discord. On June 6, 1922, at the age of 11, he was referred to the Institute for Juvenile Research by the Jewish Social Service Bureau. The reason for the referral was truancy and incorrigible at home. On July 10, 1922, the Institute recommended to the Bureau that Jack be placed in a new environment where his characteristics might be understood and where he might be afforded the supervision and recreation that would end his interest in street gangs. In March 1923, the Institute advised the Bureau that placement in a home, where intelligent supervision and discipline can be given was appropriate. The Institute's psychiatric examination, which served as a basis for these recommendations, took place in 1922. Prior to the advent of many techniques and theories of modern psychiatry, but it is the most objective evidence of Jack Ruby's childhood character. According to the psychiatric report, Jack was quick-tempered and disobedient. He frequently disagreed openly with his mother, whom he considered an inferior person with whose rules he did not have to comply. Jack told the Institute's interviewer that he ran away from home because his mother lied to him and beat him. Although Mrs. Rubenstein was severe with her children, she was described as totally incapable of coping with them because of their delinquencies, that is, principally their destructive tendencies and disregard for other people's property. His mother's extreme temperament and quarrelsomeness were cited as possible causes of Jack's bad behavior. Self-administered questionnaires revealed that Jack felt his classmates were picking on him and that he could not get along with his friends. They also indicated that, Although Jack described himself as a good ball player, he did not belong to any clubs and was not a member of any athletic teams. Jack's psychiatric interviewer reported, He could give no other good reason for running away from school except that he went to amusement parks. He has some sex knowledge and is greatly interested in sex matters. He stated that the boys in the street tell him about these things. He also claims that he can lick everyone and anybody and anything he wants to do. The interviewer noted that during mental tests he reacted quickly, often carelessly, and his attention was apt to wander so that he had to be reprimanded. A letter recommending the boy's placement in a more wholesome environment stated, He is egocentric and expects much attention, but is unable to get it as there are many children at home. His behavior is further colored by his early sex experiences, his great interest in sex and the gang situation in the street. From a superficial examination of his mother who was here with him, it is apparent that she has no insight into his problem, and she is thoroughly inadequate on the further training of this boy. Recognizing that the sketchiness of the case record precluded complete diagnosis, Dr. Raymond E. Robertson, currently the superintendent of the Institute, reported nonetheless that it seems firmly established. That his unstable and disorganized home could not provide Jack with the necessary controls and discipline. Placement in Foster Homes On July 10, 1923, a dependency hearing involving Jack, his younger brother Sam and Earl, and his sister Eileen, was held in Chicago's juvenile court. 
the petition alleged that the children were not receiving proper parental care. They had, until then, been in their mother's custody, living on Roosevelt Road, the border between Jewish and Italian districts. The juvenile court made a finding of dependency. It appointed the Jewish Home Finding Society guardian with the right to place the children in foster homes, and it ordered Joseph Rubenstein to pay the court clerk $4 per week for the support of each child. On November 24, 1924, this order was vacated, which apparently signified the termination of the guardianship and the return of the children to their mother. On April 8, 1925, the case was continued generally meaning that it was inactive but could be reactivated if the court so desired. Despite court records, the exact circumstances and length of time that Jack Ruby lived away from home are not entirely clear. Records indicate that Jack, Sam, Earl, and Eileen Rubinstein were wards of the Jewish Home Finding Society for a short time in 1922-23. However, Jack and Eileen stated they spent about four or five years in foster homes. Earl testified that he and Sam were originally sent to a private foster home and then lived on a farm for a little more than a year, while Jack was on a different farm some distance away. Subsequently the three brothers lived together in another foster home. Subsequent Home Life When Jack Ruby returned to his family, the unit was still disordered. His father remained apart from the children at least until 1936 and perhaps until a few years later. Mrs. Rubenstein's inability to manage her home, which had been reported by the Institute for Juvenile Research in 1922, apparently continued. For example, in 1937 Marion Rubenstein observed that her mother has never been any kind of a housekeeper, was careless with money, and never took much interest in the children's welfare. She was selfish, jealous, disagreeable, and never cared to do anything in the home but lie around and sleep. Dr. Hyman I. Rubenstein the son of Joseph Rubinstein's brother, recalled that Jack Ruby's mother ran an irregular household and appeared to be a rather disturbed person of poor personal appearance with no incentive for cleaning or cooking. Mrs. Rubinstein's domestic shortcomings were accompanied by symptoms of mental disease. In about 1913, two years after Jack was born, Mrs. Rubinstein began to develop a delusion that a sticking sensation in her throat was caused by a lodged fishbone. Each month Hyman, her oldest child, took her to a clinic. And each month the examining doctor, finding no organic cause for discomfort, informed her that there was nothing in her throat and that the sensation was but a figment of her imagination. According to Hyman, this practice continued for a number of years until Mrs. Rubinstein tired of it. In 1927, Mrs. Rubinstein once again began to visit clinics in connection with her fishbone delusion. Three years later, a thyroidectomy was performed, but she subsequently said it did nothing to relieve her discomfort. According to the Michael Reese Hospital, whose clinic she had visited since 1927, Mrs. Rubinstein was suffering from psychoneurosis with marked anxiety state. By order of the County Court of Cook County, Mrs. Rubinstein was committed to Elgin State Hospital on July 16, 1937. She was paroled on October 17, 1937 three months after her commitment. On January 3, 1938, the Chicago State Hospital informed Elgin State that the family desired that she be readmitted to the mental hospital. The family reported that she was uncooperative, caused constant discord, was very noisy, and used obscene language. A state social worker observed that Mrs. Rubinstein refused ever to leave the house, explaining that her children would have thrown her things out had she left. Mrs. Rubinstein rebuffed a suggestion by the social worker that she help with the dishes by stating that she would do nothing as long as her worthless husband was in the house. She was readmitted on January 14, 1938. Mrs. Rubinstein was again paroled on May 27, 1938, and was discharged as improved on August 25, 1938. She stayed in an apartment with Marion, and her separation from the rest of the family apparently ended most of the difficulties. Subsequently, Jack Ruby's parents were apparently reconciled, since their alien registration forms, filed in late 1940, indicated that they both resided at Marion's address. Fanny Rubinstein was admitted to Michael Reese Hospital on April 4, 1944, as a result of a heart ailment. 
Her condition was complicated by an attack of pneumonia and she died at the hospital on April 11, 1944. Hyman testified that, perhaps because she favored the education of her children and they recognized her difficulties in rearing them during a turbulent marriage, they all remembered Mrs. Rubinstein with warmth and affection. The evidence also indicates that Jack, notwithstanding his earlier attitudes, became especially fond of his mother. Following his wife's death, Joseph Rubinstein stayed with the children in Chicago, where he died at the age of 87, on December 24, 1958. Education Records provided by the Chicago Board of Education revealed that Jack Ruby attended Smythe Grammar School from October 24, 1916, through the 1920-21 term, completing kindergarten to grade 4B. He repeated the third grade. During the 1921-22 school year Jack finished the fourth grade at the Clark School. He attended Schley School for the 1924-25 term, when he completed the sixth grade. Ruby's relationship with the Institute for Juvenile Research and the Jewish Home Finding Society may explain the lack of academic records for the 1922-23 and 1923-24 school years. While there is some uncertainty about Ruby's education subsequent to September 1925, it seems likely that he completed the 8th grade in 1927, when he was 16. Although Jack Ruby and others have stated that he attended at least one year of high school, the Chicago Board of Education could not locate any record of Ruby's attending Chicago high schools. Considering the absence of academic records and Jack's apathetic attitude towards school, the commission deems it unlikely that his education extended into high school. Records of the Institute for Juvenile Research revealed that, as of June 1922, Ruby had no religious education outside the public school system. However, according to their children, Jack's parents made some effort to inculcate in them a desire to adhere to the tenets of Orthodox Judaism. Jewish dietary and festival laws were observed and several of the children accompanied Joseph Rubinstein to the synagogue. Earl Ruby stated that all the boys received some Hebrew school training until the breakup of the Rubinstein home in 1921. However, Hyman Rubinstein testified that the instability and economic necessities of the household and the children's relationships outside the home frustrated the religious efforts of Ruby's parents. Activities Born in a home that disintegrated when he was 10 and boasting no substantial educational background, Jack Ruby early found himself on Chicago streets attempting to provide for himself and other members of his family. An avid sports fan, he, together with many of his friends, scalped tickets to various sporting events. He also sold numerous novelty items and knickknacks, particularly those connected with professional and collegiate athletics. Even in his youth, Ruby declined to work on a steady basis for someone else. According to his brother Hyman, Jack Ruby's only legal difficulty as a youth resulted from an altercation with a policeman about ticket scalping. Hyman, then active in local politics, was able to have charges arising out of the incident dropped. Ruby has indicated that during the Depression he served short jail sentence for the unauthorized sale of copyrighted sheet music. The only other member of the Rubinstein family who appears to have had any difficulty with the law while a youth was Hyman. On May 1, 1916, Chicago's juvenile court declared Hyman incorrigible, a term covering a wide range of misbehavior. Because of the absence of informative court records and the lapse of time, the misconduct that occasioned this proceeding could not be ascertained, but Hyman is not known to have encountered subsequent difficulty. Some of Ruby's childhood friends eventually became criminals. However, Hyman Rubinstein, his sister Mrs. Eva Grant, and virtually all of Ruby's friends and acquaintances who were questioned reported that he was not involved with Chicago's criminal element. The evidence indicates that young Jack was not interested in political affairs. Hyman was the only Rubinstein to participate actively in politics. Sponsored by various political officials, he became a sidewalk inspector and warehouse investigator for eight years. On one occasion, he obtained a permit for Jack to sell novelties from a pushcart located in a business district during the pre-Christmas buying rush. Eventually the complaints of enraged businessmen led licensing authorities to declare that a mistake had been made and to revoke Ruby's permit. Temperament 
the evidence reveals striking differences of opinion among childhood friends and acquaintances of Jack Ruby about whether he possessed violent tendencies. Many persons stated that he was mild-mannered, quiet, and even-tempered. Former welterweight champion Barney Ross, whom Jack Ruby idolized from the inception of his boxing career, stated that Ruby was well-behaved, was never a troublemaker, and was never involved with law enforcement agencies. Another friend, who became a successful businessman on the West Coast, said that, as a youth, Ruby never started fights even though he was adept with his fists. Other friends declared that he would, if at all possible, avoid clashes. But many other friends and acquaintances recalled that he had a hot temper and was quickly moved to violent acts or words. One friend explained that in the tough Chicago neighborhood where they lived, self-defense was vitally important and added that Ruby was fully capable of defending himself. Another friend described Ruby as quick-tempered and, though unlikely to pick fights, willing to accept any challenge without regard to the odds against him. Young Jack also interfered in fights, particularly when the person he was aiding appeared to be taking a severe beating or in a disadvantageous position. Others reported that he had the reputation of being a good street brawler. One school friend recalled that when Jack argued vehemently about sports, he occasionally used a stick or other available weapon. He reported, however, that after Ruby's anger subsided, he reverted to his normal, likable character. From early childhood, Jack Ruby was called Sparky by those who knew him. According to his sister Eva Grant, the nickname derived from the way Jack wobbled when he walked. He was thought to resemble the slow-moving horse called Sparky or a spark plug depicted in a contemporary comic strip. Mrs. Grant testified that her brother became incensed when called Sparky and that from the time he was about eight years old he would strike anyone calling him by the name. A childhood friend also recalled that Jack hated the nickname and would fight when called by it. Mrs. Grant was unsure whether the nickname Sparky did not also result from his quick reaction to the taunts of young friends. Hyman Rubinstein thought that the nickname derived from Jack's speed, aggressiveness, and quick thinking. The many accounts of Ruby's lightning-like temper lend credence to the theory, widely held, that his nickname was connected with his volatility. Young Manhood 1933-43 San Francisco 1933-37 Jack Ruby reported that in about 1933, he and several Chicago friends went to Los Angeles and, shortly thereafter, to San Francisco. Although there is evidence that he stayed there until 1938, 1939, or 1940, Ruby stated that he returned to Chicago in about 1937, and this appears to have been the case. Eva Grant testified that Ruby went to the West Coast because he believed employment would be available there. Eva, who married Hyman Majid in Chicago in 1930, was divorced in early 1934 and in about June of that year joined her brother Jack in San Francisco. She and her son, Ronald, shared an apartment with him. In 1936, Eva married Frank Gronovsky, also known as Frank Grant, in San Francisco, and Ruby shared a four-room apartment with them and Ronald for a short while. Occupations and Activities Ruby stated that when he and his friends arrived in Los Angeles, they sold a handicapper's tip sheet for horse races at Santa Anita Racetrack which had just opened. Eva Grant testified that Ruby also worked as a singing waiter in Los Angeles, but made very little money. When the group moved to San Francisco, Ruby continued to sell tip sheets at Bay Meadows Racetrack. Subsequently, he became a door-to-door -door salesman of subscriptions to San Francisco newspapers. Although there is some evidence that he ultimately became chief of his crew and had several people working under him, other reports indicate that this is unlikely. Eva Grant testified that she also sold newspaper subscriptions but was less proficient than her brother and relied upon him for advice and support. Although virtually all his San Francisco acquaintances knew Jack Ruby as Sparky, there is no evidence that he engaged in violent activities in San Francisco or was reputed to possess a vicious temper. One friend, who stated that he resided with Ruby and Eva for about a year, described him as a well-mannered, likable individual who was soft-spoken and meticulous in his dress and appearance. Another friend described him as a clean-cut, honest kid, and the manager of a crew with which Ruby worked stated that he had a good reputation and appeared to be an honest, forthright person. 
The crew manager reported that Ruby associated with a sports crowd, some of whose members were involved with professional boxing, but not with criminals. He added that Ruby had a personal liking for law enforcement and would have wanted to become a police officer had he been larger physically. One friend reported that although Ruby always associated with Jewish people, he never exhibited great interest in religion. Ruby met Virginia Belasco, granddaughter of the prominent playwright and actor, David Belasco, in about 1936 at a dance at the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco. Miss Belasco stated that while a teenager she saw Ruby socially on several occasions between 1936 and 1941. The only other evidence concerning Ruby's social activities while in San Francisco is his statement to his longtime girlfriend, Alice Nichols of Dallas, that while in San Francisco he met the only other woman, Virginia Fitzgerald or Fitzsimmons, that he ever considered marrying. Chicago 1937-43 Jack Ruby stated that following his return to Chicago, he was unemployed for a considerable period. However, when his mother was admitted to Elgin State Hospital in 1937, she reported that he was employed as a traveling salesman apparently living away from home. Although there is conflicting evidence about his ability to earn a comfortable living, he apparently was able to maintain a normal existence and required no financial assistance from his family or friends. He continued to be a so-called hustler, scalping tickets and buying watches and other small items for resale at discount prices. One of his closest Chicago friends stated that Ruby's sales and promotions were shady but legitimate. Labor Union Activities Ruby reported that in about 1937 he became active in local 20,467 of the Scrap Iron and Junk Handlers Union. At this time, his friend, attorney Leon Cook, was the local's financial secretary. Records provided by the Social Security Administration indicate that Ruby was employed by the union from late 1937 until early 1940. He worked as a union organizer and negotiated with employers on its behalf. On December 8, 1939, the union's president, John Martin, shot Cook, who died of gunshot wounds on January 5, 1940. Martin was subsequently acquitted on the ground of self-defense. Although a Jack Rubinstein is mentioned in the minutes of a union meeting on February 2, 1940, and Ruby is reported to have said after Cook's death that he wanted to take over the union, the evidence indicates that Ruby was so upset by Cook's death that he was unable to devote himself further to union activities and left its employ. Ruby reported that after Cook's death he adopted the middle name Leon, which he used only infrequently, in memory of his friend. Since Ruby was the ultimate source of all but one of these accounts, other descriptions of Ruby's separation from the Union cannot with certainty be deemed inaccurate. These reports indicated that Ruby might have been forced out of the Union by a criminal group, or might have left because he lacked the emotional stability necessary for successful labor negotiations or because he felt he was not earning enough money with the Union. Although the AFL-CIO investigated the ethical practices of Local 20467 in 1956, placed a local in trusteeship, and suspended Paul Dorfman, who succeeded Martin and Cook, there is no evidence that Ruby's union activities were connected with Chicago's criminal element. Several long-time members of the union reported that it had a good reputation when Ruby was affiliated with it and employers who negotiated with it have given no indication that it had criminal connections. Subsequent Employment In 1941, Ruby and Harry Epstein organized the Spartan Novelty Company, a small firm that sold in various northeastern states small cedar chests containing candy and gambling devices known as punch boards. Earl Ruby and two of Jack Ruby's friends Martin Gimple and Martin Shuggle, were also associated in this venture. The group had no fixed addresses, living in hotels. Late in 1941, Jack Ruby returned to Chicago, where he continued his punchboard business through the mails. Following the December 7, 1941, attack on Pearl Harbor, he and several friends decided to design and sell plaques commemorating the Day of Infamy. However, the venture was impeded by Ruby's perfectionistic approach to details of design which resulted in numerous production delays. By the time Ruby's copyrighted plaque was finally ready for sale, the market was flooded with similar items. At about this time, Ruby also sold busts of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
In late 1942 and 1943, Ruby was employed by the Globe Auto Glass Company and Universal Sales Company. Although one of Ruby's acquaintances at this time described him as a coconut on the subject of patriotism, the evidence does not indicate that Ruby's promotion of Remember Pearl Harbor plaques and Roosevelt busts was motivated by patriotic or political considerations. Rather, the sale of these items was, to Ruby, just another commercial venture, but he might also have considered these sales a good thing. Numerous friends reported that, Ruby had no interest in political affairs during this period, although he greatly admired President Roosevelt. Other Activities The evidence indicates that Ruby led a normal social life during these years. Virginia Belasco stated that while Ruby was selling punch boards in New York during November 1941, he entertained her each weekend. Other reports indicate that Ruby fancied himself a ladies' man, enjoyed dancing, almost always had female accompaniment and was very gentlemanly with women. Ruby, with several friends, frequently attempted to disrupt rallies of the German-American Bund. One acquaintance reported that Ruby was responsible for cracking a few heads of Bund members. Apparently he joined in this activity for ethnic rather than political reasons. The young men in the group were not organized adherents of any particular political creed, but were pool hall and tavern companions from Ruby's Jewish neighborhood who gathered on the spur of the moment to present opposition when they learned that the pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic Bund movement was planning a meeting. Hyman Rubinstein testified that Ruby would fight with any person making derogatory comments about his ethnic origins, and others have stated that Ruby would fight with anyone he suspected of pro-Nazi or anti-Semitic tendencies. During this period Ruby, though temperamental, apparently engaged in no unusual acts of violence. However, he did interfere on several occasions when he thought someone was treated unfairly. A friend who described Ruby as somewhat overbearing regarding the rights and feelings of others, reported that Ruby fought two college students who insulted a Negro piano player. Another friend reported that Ruby had a bitter fight with a man who was abusing an older woman. Maintaining his friendship with Barney Ross, and still an ardent sports fan, Ruby associated with various figures in the boxing world and regularly attended the fights at Marigold Gardens. He frequented the Lawndale Pool Room and Restaurant a rallying point for the anti-Bundists and chief hangout of many of Ruby's friends. In addition, Ruby, described as a health nut who earnestly contended that he could hit harder than Joe Lewis, exercised at several athletic clubs despite Ruby's participation in shady financial enterprises, his association with a labor union subsequently disciplined by the AFL-CIO, his participation in violent anti-Bund activities, and his connection with a pool room. The evidence falls short of demonstrating that Ruby was significantly affiliated with organized crime in Chicago. Virtually all of Ruby's Chicago friends stated he had no close connection with organized crime. In addition, unreliable as their reports may be, several known Chicago criminals have denied any such liaison. The commission finds it difficult to attach credence to a newspaper reporter's contrary statement that his undisclosed syndicate sources revealed Ruby was connected with organized crime and confidence games. Ruby was unquestionably familiar, if not friendly, with some Chicago criminals, but there is no evidence that he ever participated in organized criminal activity. Military Activities 1943-46 in September 1941, Jack Ruby was apparently classified 1A and declared eligible for the draft. Subsequently he appeared before a local board and was reclassified 1H or 3A between August 31, 1941, and November 19, 1942, when it was abolished. The 1H classification applied to registrants who had reached their 28th birthday and were, therefore, no longer liable for service. The 3A deferment applies to persons whose entry into military service presents financial hardship to dependents. Because of the length of time involved and the destruction of local draft board records, Ruby's precise status or the reason for his deferment could not be ascertained. According to one somewhat unreliable report, Ruby, immediately prior to his physical examination, feigned a hearing disability and occasionally wore a hearing aid. Hyman Rubinstein who testified that Jack was deferred because of economic hardship since he the only one home, specifically denied the truthfulness of this allegation. 
Early in 1943, Ruby was again classified L.A., and, following an unsuccessful appearance before his appeal board, he was inducted into the U.S. Army Air Forces on May 21, 1943. Jack was the last of the Rubenstein brothers to enter the service. Previously, Earl had enlisted in the Navy, Sam was in Army Air Force Intelligence and Hyman was in the field artillery. Except for five weeks in Farmingdale, NY, Ruby spent his military days at various air bases in the South. He received the basic training given all recruits and advanced training as an aircraft mechanic on August 2, 1943. He passed marksmanship tests with the .30 caliber carbine and the .45 caliber submachine gun, but failed with the .30 caliber rifle. On February 10, 1944, he earned a sharpshooter's rating for his firing of an M1.30 caliber carbine. His character and efficiency ratings, when determined, were excellent. After attaining the rank of Private First Class and receiving the Good Conduct Medal, Ruby was honorably discharged on February 21, 1946. Two persons who recalled Ruby while he was in the Army Air Forces asserted that he was extremely sensitive to insulting remarks about Jews. When, during an argument, a sergeant called Ruby a Jew bastard, Ruby reportedly attacked him and beat him with his fists. There is conflicting evidence about the zeal with which Ruby performed his military duties. One associate indicated that Ruby, who at 34 was the oldest in his group, always worked harder than the others to prove that he could keep up with them. Another recalled by contrast, that Ruby had no liking for work and carefully avoided situations requiring him to dirty his hands. However, there is no basis in the record for the inference that Ruby was in any way anti-American. Ruby frequently expressed to some fellow soldiers his high regard for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Two independent sources reported that he cried openly when informed of Roosevelt's death in April 1945. This did not indicate any sudden political interest, however, since none of his known military associates reported such an interest, and Ruby's admiration for President Roosevelt anteceded his military days. While in service, Ruby is reported to have continued his promotional ventures. One person recalled that in 1944, Jack received punch boards and chocolates from someone in Chicago and peddled these items through the base to make extra money. This person also indicated that Ruby enjoyed card and dice games in or near the barracks. Post-War Chicago 1946-47 Following his discharge from the Army Air Forces in February 1946, Jack Ruby returned to Chicago. He joined his three brothers, who had previously been discharged from the service, in the Earl Products Company. Earl Ruby testified that he was the sole investor in the enterprise, but each brother received an equal ownership interest on his return from the service. The company manufactured and sold small cedar chests and distributed punch boards. In addition, it made aluminum salt and pepper shakers, keychains, bottle openers, screwdrivers, and small hammers. Sam supervised the manufacturing end of the business, while Earl managed the office and advertising. Jack was in charge of sales, but the company was small and he had no subordinates. Because insufficient profits led to frequent arguments, Hyman soon left Earl Products. Jack who stayed with the company through most of 1947, had many disputes with his brothers because he insisted on selling the products of other companies, such as costume jewelry, and he did not like traveling outside the Chicago area. Earl and Sam finally purchased Jack's interest, paying him more than $14,000 in his cash. Although there is some evidence to the contrary, it is unlikely that Ruby was in the nightclub business in Chicago during the post-war period. Many who have reported this may have mistaken him for Harry Rubinstein, who was convicted of manslaughter and operated several such establishments. None of Jack Ruby's close friends or relatives indicated that he was in the nightclub business. Following his return from the army, Ruby was described as ready to fight with any person who insulted Jews or the military. Earl Ruby testified that on one occasion in 1946, Jack returned from downtown Chicago with his suit covered with blood. He explained at that time that he had fought with a person who had called him a dirty Jew or something like that. 
Other evidence indicates that Ruby's personality was not substantially changed by his military experience. One person who met him in 1947 reported that Ruby was a fashionable dresser. He continued to be described as soft-spoken, although he was also known as hot-tempered. Ruby worked out regularly at an athletic club, and one friend regarded him as a Romeo, who was quite successful in attracting young women. Dallas 1947-63 The Move to Dallas During World War II, Ruby's sister, Eva Grant, visited Dallas. Having operated a restaurant on the West Coast, and considering it a lucrative business, she arranged, near the end of 1945, to lease a building under construction in Dallas, which she ran as a nightclub. Part of the financing for this establishment, the Singapore Supper Club, was provided by her brothers. Jack Ruby, who apparently obtained the money from Earl Products, set $1,100 as a down payment on the lease, Earl contributed about $1,500, and Hyman paid for more than $2,000 worth of equipment. Before she opened the Singapore in 1947, Eva Grant engaged in the sale of metal products. In that year she met Paul Roland Jones, who allegedly was seeking customers for Iron Pipe and whom she referred to Hyman Rubinstein. Jones had, at about that time, been convicted of attempting to bribe the newly elected sheriff of Dallas. On October 24, 1947, he was arrested for violating federal narcotics statutes. Jack Ruby had visited Dallas early in 1947 to help Eva Grant manage the Singapore, and five days after Jones' arrest, Jack and Hyman Rubinstein were interrogated in Chicago by agents of the Bureau of Narcotics. The brothers admitted knowing Jones but denied awareness of his connection with narcotics. During the two years in which Jones was appealing his conviction he and other criminals frequented the Singapore Club, then operated by Jack Ruby. Intensive investigation to determine whether Jack Ruby was criminally or otherwise connected with Jones' narcotics violation leads the commission to conclude Ruby probably was not involved. A search of the files of the Bureau of Narcotics disclosed no record that either Hyman or Jack had been prosecuted by federal authorities in 1947. Jack, Hyman, and Eva denied participating in any narcotics activities. Jones and his co-conspirators also denied that Jack was a participant. One of Jones' confederates reported after the shooting of Oswald that although Jones propositioned the two brothers concerning narcotics, they refused to participate. Moreover, when one of the conspirators was arrested with 48 pounds of raw opium in his possession, he implicated Jones and another person, both of whom were convicted, but he did not implicate Jack Ruby or his brother. Late in 1947, Ruby established permanent residence in Dallas. Shortly after shooting Oswald, Ruby stated that he returned to Dallas at Eva Grant's request to help her operate the Singapore Supper Club. However, on December 21, 1963, he reported that although association with his sister had been the purport of his initial visit to Dallas, he returned there because of the failure of his merchandising deals in Chicago. These factors in conjunction with his separation from Earl Products, probably motivated Ruby's move to Dallas. A different reason has been given by Steve Guthrie, former sheriff of Dallas. Guthrie reported that shortly after his election as sheriff in July 1946, Paul Roland Jones, representing other Chicago criminals, offered him a substantial amount of money to permit them to move in and manage illegal activities in Dallas. Although he never met Ruby, Guthrie asserted that these criminals frequently mentioned that Ruby would operate a fabulous restaurant as a front for gambling activities. Despite its source, the commission finds it difficult to accept this report. A member of the Dallas Police Department, Lt. George East Butler, who was present during virtually all the conversations between Guthrie and Jones and who performed considerable investigative work on the case, stated that Ruby was not involved in the bribery attempt and that he had not heard of Ruby until the investigation and trial of Jones had been completed. He explained that Ruby's connection with the case stemmed from the fact that, as mentioned previously, Jones and other criminals frequented the Singapore Supper Club. In 22 recordings of the conversations between Guthrie, Butler, and Jones not only failed to mention Ruby, but indicate that Jones was to bring from outside the Dallas area only one confederate, who was not to be Jewish. 
the change of name. Sometime in 1947, Jack Ruby's brothers Earl and Sam, pursuant to a joint understanding, legally changed their names from Rubenstein to Ruby. Earl testified that he changed his name because everyone called him Ruby and because a former employer advised him that it was preferable not to use a Jewish name on mail orders for Earl products. On December 30, 1947, Jack changed his name to Jack L. Ruby by securing a decree from the 68th Judicial District Court of Dallas. His petition alleged that he sought the change because the name Rubenstein was misunderstood and too long and because he was well known as Jack L. Ruby. The Bureau of Narcotics report of his relationship with Paul Roland Jones indicates that as of October 29, 1947, Jack was known as Ruby. However, several persons in Dallas knew him as Rubenstein. Nightclub Operations Except for a brief period in about 1953, when Ruby managed the Hervé Theater, a motion picture house, the operation of nightclubs and dance halls was his primary source of income and his basic interest in life during the 16 years he spent in Dallas prior to shooting Lee Oswald. When Ruby first arrived in Dallas in 1947, he and Eva Grant jointly managed the Singapore Supper Club. Shortly thereafter, she returned to the West Coast. Except for sporadic trips to Dallas, she remained there until 1959, leaving Ruby a power of attorney. Ruby who had received $14,000 from the sale of his interest in Earl products, invested a substantial amount in the club, which Mrs. Grant described as too nice a club for that part of town. Ruby changed the Singapore's name to the Silver Spur Club. It was operated primarily as a dance hall, serving beer to its patrons. In about 1952, Ruby borrowed $3,700 from a friend, Ralph Paul to purchase the Bob Wills Ranch House with Martin Gimple, a former associate in the Spartan Novelty Company. The ranch house was run as a western-type nightclub. With two establishments to run, Ruby experienced substantial financial reversals in 1952. He abandoned his interest in the ranch house and, on July 1, 1952, transferred the Silver Spur to Gimple and Willie Epstein, who assumed some of its debts. Disappointed by these setbacks, Ruby stated that he had a mental breakdown, and hibernated in the Cotton Bowl Hotel in Dallas for three or four months, declining to see his friends. Still depressed, he then returned to Chicago, apparently intending to remain there permanently. However, he stayed only six weeks. Gimple and Epstein were anxious to be rid of the Silver Spur and Ruby once again became its owner. In 1953, Ruby obtained an interest in the Vegas Club, which he operated with Joe Bonds until September 1953. At that time he informed Irving Alcana, who had retained the prior ownership interest, that he was unable to meet his obligations with respect to the club. Alcana then assumed management of the Vegas until June 19, 1954, when, following numerous disagreements with him, he sold Ruby his interest. Ruby still owned the Vegas Club at the time of his arrest on November 24, 1963. However, when Eva Grant returned from San Francisco in 1959, she assumed management of the club, receiving a salary but no ownership interest. The Vegas, which occasionally featured striptease acts, employed a dance band and served beer, wine, soft drinks and some prepared foods. In 1954, Ruby's Vegas associate, Joe Bonds, was convicted of sodomy and sent to a Texas penitentiary to serve an eight-year sentence. In 1955, Ruby sold the Silver Spur to Roscoe Rocky Robinson. However, Robinson could not obtain a license to operate the club and it was subsequently closed. For a few months during this period, Ruby also operated Hernando's Hideaway, but this venture proved unsuccessful. Sam Ruby testified that shortly after he sold his interest in Earl Products in mid-1955 and moved to Dallas, he loaned Jack $5,500 to enable him to pay federal excise taxes on the Vegas. As security for the loan, Sam required Jack to execute a bill of sale of the Vegas. Upon Jack's default in payment, Sam instituted suit, claiming that he owned the Vegas and that Jack had breached his promise to repurchase it. The case was ultimately settled, with Jack retaining his ownership interest in the club. In late 1959, Jack Ruby became a partner of Joe Slatton in establishing the Sovereign Club, 
a private club that was apparently permitted by Texas law to sell liquor to members. Since Slatton was troubled about Dallas news stories describing police raids on a private club that permitted gambling, he felt he needed more capital. Ruby invested about $6,000 which he borrowed from his brother Earl and perhaps some of his own money. The Sovereign was described as a plush and exclusive club, and Ruby was apparently very anxious to attract a wealthy carriage trade. The venture was not successful, however. The two men could not work together, and Slatten withdrew in early 1960. Ruby turned for new capital to Ralph Paul, who had operated a Dallas club with Joe Bonds. Ruby still owed Paul $1,200 of the $3,700 loan made in connection with the Bob Wills Ranch House, but Paul advanced him another $2,200, which allowed him to pay the sovereign's rent for four months. Subsequently, Ruby spontaneously gave Paul a stock certificate representing 50% of the equity of the corporation owning the club. Ruby told Paul that if the venture failed the sovereign's fixtures and other physical property would belong to Paul. Experiencing difficulty in recruiting sufficient members, Ruby soon found himself again unable to pay the sovereign's monthly rent of $550. Again he turned to Paul, who loaned him $1,650 on the condition that he changed the club's method of operation. Paul insisted that Ruby discontinue club memberships, even though this would prevent the sale of liquor, and offer striptease shows as a substitute attraction. Ruby agreed and the Sovereign's name was changed to the Carousel Club. It became one of three downtown Dallas burlesque clubs and served champagne, beer, setups and pizza, its only food. The Carousel generally employed four strippers, a master of ceremonies, an assistant manager, a band, three or four waitresses, and a porter or handyman. Net receipts averaged about $5,000 per month most of which was allocated to the club's payroll. Late in 1963, Ruby began to distribute permanent passes to the carousel. However, the cards were apparently designed solely for publicity and did not affect the club's legal status. Employee Relationships Ruby's employees displayed a wide range of personal reactions to him. Those associated with Ruby long enough to grow accustomed to his violent temper and constant threats of discharge generally portrayed him sympathetically. They reported he was genuinely interested in their welfare and happiness. In addition, many former employees stated that he was a pleasant or unobjectionable employer. There is also considerable evidence that Ruby tended to dominate his employees, frequently resorted to violence in dealing with them, publicly embarrassed them, sometimes attempted to cheat them of their pay, and delayed paying their salaries. Other employees reported Ruby continually harassed his help and used obscene language in their presence. However he frequently apologized, sought to atone for his many temper tantrums, and completely forgot others. One of the many violent incidents that were reported took place in 1950, when Ruby struck an employee over the head with a blackjack. In 1951, after his guitarist, Willis Dickerson, told Ruby to go to hell, Ruby knocked Dickerson to the ground, then pinned him to a wall and kicked him in the groin. During the scuffle, Dickerson bit Ruby's finger so badly that the top half of Ruby's left index finger was amputated. In approximately 1955, Ruby beat one of his musicians with brass knuckles. The musician's mouth required numerous stitches. During 1960, Ruby and two entertainers, Breck Wall and Joe Peterson, entered into an agreement that the performers would produce and star in a review at the Sovereign in exchange for a 50% interest in the club. After performing for two months, the entertainers complained that they had received neither a share of the profits nor evidence of their proprietary interest. Ruby responded by hitting Peterson in the mouth, knocking out a tooth. The two men left the Sovereign's employ, but they subsequently accepted Ruby's apology and resumed their friendship with him. In September 1969, Frank Ferraro, the carousel's handyman, became involved in a dispute at a nearby bar. Ruby told him not to get into a fight, and Ferraro told Ruby to mind his own business. Ruby then followed Ferraro to another club and beat him severely. Ferraro required emergency hospital treatment for his eye, but he decided not to press charges since Ruby paid for his hospital care. 
In March 1963, during an argument about wages, Ruby threatened to throw a cigarette girl down the stairs of the carousel. Ruby's relationship with his employees commanded much of his attention during the months preceding the assassination. The carousel's comparatively high turnover rate and Ruby's intense desire to succeed required him to meet numerous prospective employees, patrons, and other persons who might help improve his business. Ruby frequently encountered difficulties with the American Guild of Variety Artists AGVA, the union which represented carousel entertainers for several years. Starting in about 1961, he unsuccessfully sought modification of AGVA's policy permitting amateur strippers, inexperienced girls paid less than union scale wages, to perform at union houses. Ruby apparently believed his two competitors, the Weinstein brothers, were scheduling amateur shows in a manner calculated to destroy his business. Ruby's discontent with AGVA grew particularly acute during the late summer and early fall of 1963 when, in addition to meeting with AGVA officials, he called upon several acquaintances, including known criminals, who, he thought, could influence AGVA on his behalf. Other problems with AGVA arose because of his policy of continuous shows, which did not give Masters of Ceremonies enough time off, and his alleged use of AGVA members to mingle with patrons to promote the consumption of liquor. In June 1963, Ruby visited New Orleans, where he obtained the services of a stripper known as Jada, who became his featured performer. Jada and Ruby had numerous contract disputes and he was concerned about her high salary, recurrent absenteeism, and diminishing drawing power. Moreover, he thought that Jada had deliberately exceeded even the carousel's liberal standards of decency in order to cause him to lose his license or to obtain publicity for herself. On several occasions Ruby excitedly turned off the spotlights during her act, and at the end of October 1963, he fired her. However, after Jada sued out a peace bond, she apparently recovered a week's salary from Ruby. In addition to problems with his star stripper, the carousel was required to employ three masters of ceremonies in rapid succession following the departure in about September 1963, of Wally Weston, who worked there about 15 months. And in early November, the band that had played at the Vegas club for about eight years left the Vegas to accept the offer of another Dallas club. Financial Data and Tax Problems Jack Ruby's pockets and the trunk of his car served as his bank. With a few exceptions, Ruby and his clubs rarely employed bank accounts. Instead, Ruby carried his cash with him, paying the bulk of his expenses and debts directly out of club receipts. During the latter half of 1963, the Carousel, the Vegas, and Ruby each maintained checking accounts at the Merchants State Bank in Dallas. Balances of the latter two accounts never exceeded $275. In July 1963, the carousel's account had more than $500. After August 8, its maximum balance was less than $800. Between May 31 and November 24, 1963, 53 checks were drawn on the three accounts. With the exception of one check for $129.47, all were for less than $100. He generally purchased cashier's checks at the Merchants State Bank to pay his monthly rental of $550 for the carousel and $500 for the Vegas. He also purchased cashier's checks during the three months prior to the assassination to pay about $1,500 to the Texas State Treasurer, $110 to Temple Sheriff Israel, apparently for Jewish High Holy Day tickets and $60 to the American Society of Authors and Publishers. Records of the more than 50 banking institutions checked during the investigation of Ruby's financial affairs revealed that he had three other dormant accounts, all with small balances. Two safety deposit boxes belonging to Ruby, opened by Texas officials pursuant to search warrants, were empty and unused for more than a year prior to the assassination. Although Ruby negotiated several loans at the Merchants State Bank, there is no evidence that he was the maker or co-maker of other loans, and, after investigation, the Dallas Police Department found no record that Ruby co-signed the note of any policeman at any time. Ruby's financial records were chaotic. One accountant abandoned efforts to prepare income tax returns and other financial statements because of the hopeless disarray of Ruby's data. 
The record indicates that Ruby was frequently weeks, if not months, late in filing federal tax forms and that he held numerous conferences with internal revenue agents who attempted to obtain the delinquent statements. Ruby encountered serious difficulties with respect to state franchise and federal excise and income taxes. The Texas Charter of the Corporation Controlling the Sovereign and Carousel Clubs was cancelled in 1961, because Ruby failed to pay Texas franchise taxes. And, only after numerous conferences, did Ruby and representatives of the Internal Revenue Service reach agreements on installment payments of various federal tax liabilities, to which Ruby more or less adhered. Ruby's primary difficulty concerned federal excise taxes. Advised by an attorney that the Vegas Club, a dance hall providing food, was not subject to federal excise taxes because it was not a cabaret, Ruby charged Vegas patrons on the assumption that no excise taxes were due. However, his attorney reported, when federal courts ruled that dance halls providing incidental food were subject to excise taxes as cabarets, Ruby became liable to the federal government for more than six years of taxes, amounting, with interest, to almost exactly $40,000. Ruby also fell behind on his personal income tax payments. At the time of his arrest he owed more than $4,400 for 1959 and 1960. Remittances accompanied his 1961 and 1962 tax forms, the latter received by the office of the Dallas District Director on September 18, 1963. The following table summarizes amounts which Ruby reported as gross and net income from the Vegas Club from 1956 to 1962. And the taxes due, year gross income net income tax 1962 $41,462.77 $5,619.65 $1.00. 217. 75 estimated 1961 40,411.00 6,255.291,200.00 estimated 1960 44,482.419,703.902. 3,24.6450.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.8650.
and the Bob Wills Ranch House. In about 1953 or 1954, Ruby took Little Daddy and his parents to Chicago to obtain a television appearance for him. However, shortly after their arrival, Ruby was confronted by a second woman claiming to be Little Daddy's mother. Upon advice of counsel, Ruby decided to abandon the venture. In 1954, Ruby became interested in the sale of pizza crusts to Dallas restaurants. He is also reported to have sold an arthritic preparation and to have manufactured and sold Minin, a liquid vitamin formula. In about 1958 or 1959, Ruby attempted to build and sell log cabins at a Texas lake resort. In early 1959, he investigated the possibility of selling Jeeps to Cuba. He is also reported to have furnished entertainment for a Dallas hotel, to have promoted records for musicians and to have sold English stainless steel razor blades. In October 1963 Ruby assisted the producers of a carnival show, How Hollywood Makes Movies, appearing at the Texas State Fair. At about this time Ruby also sought to open a new club in Dallas. He conferred with numerous persons and placed advertisements in Dallas newspapers in an attempt to obtain financial backing. Assuming that he would be occupied by the new club, Ruby offered his oldest brother, Hyman, a managerial post at the carousel. However, Hyman, who had recently lost his sales territory, declined the offer because he felt he was too old for the nightclub business. Ruby unsuccessfully attempted to sell twist boards an exercising device consisting of two square fiberboards separated by ball bearings. Despite the contrary advice of his brother Earl, Jack ordered several dozen twist boards and had 2,000 promotional flyers published. He had one of the strippers demonstrate the twist boards at the Texas Products Show during the first week of November 1963. Arrests and Violations Between 1949 and November 24, 1963, Ruby was arrested eight times by the Dallas Police Department. The dates, charges, and dispositions of these arrests are as follows. February 4, 1949, Ruby paid a $10 fine for disturbing the peace. July 26, 1953, Ruby was suspected of carrying a concealed weapon. However, no charges were filed and Ruby was released on the same day. May 1, 1954, Ruby was arrested for allegedly carrying a concealed weapon and violating a peace bond. Again no charges were filed and Ruby was released on the same day. December 5, 1954, Ruby was arrested for allegedly violating state liquor laws by selling liquor after hours. The complaint was dismissed on February 8, 1955. June 21, 1959, Ruby was arrested for allegedly permitting dancing after hours. The complaint was dismissed on July 8, 1959. August 21, 1960, Ruby was again arrested for allegedly permitting dancing after hours. Ruby posted $25 bond and was released on that date. February 12, 1963, Ruby was arrested on a charge of simple assault. He was found not guilty February 27, 1963. Finally, on March 14, 1963, Ruby was arrested for allegedly ignoring traffic summonses. A $35 bond was posted. When Ruby applied for a beer license in March 1961, he reported that he had been arrested about four or five times between 1947 and 1953. Between 1950 and 1963, he received 20 tickets for motor vehicle violations, paying for $10 fines and 3 of $3. In 1956 and 1959, Ruby was placed on six months probation as a traffic violator. Ruby was also frequently suspended by the Texas Liquor Control Board. In August 1949, when he was operating the Silver Spur, he was suspended for five days on a charge of agents, moral turpitude, in 1953 Ruby received a five-day suspension because of an obscene show, and, in 1954, a 10-day suspension for allowing a drunkard on his premises. On February 18, 1954, he was suspended for five days because of an obscene striptease act at the Silver Spurs and for the consumption of alcoholic beverages during prohibited hours. On March 26, 1956, Ruby was suspended by the liquor board for three days because several of his checks were dishonored. 
On October 23, 1961, he received another three-day suspension because an agent solicited the sale of alcoholic beverages for consumption on licensed premises. Police Associations Although the precise nature of his relationship to members of the Dallas Police Department is not susceptible of conclusive evaluation, the evidence indicates that Ruby was keenly interested in policemen and their work. Jesse Curry, chief of the Dallas Police Department, testified that no more than 25 to 50 of Dallas' almost 1,200 policemen were acquainted with Ruby. However, the reports of present and past members of the Dallas Police Department as well as Ruby's employees and acquaintances indicate that Ruby's police friendships were far more widespread than those of the average citizen. There is no credible evidence that Ruby sought special favors from police officers or attempted to bribe them. Although there is considerable evidence that Ruby gave policemen reduced rates, declined to exact any cover charge from them, and gave them free coffee and soft drinks. This hospitality was not unusual for a Dallas nightclub operator. Ruby's personal attachment to police officers is demonstrated by reports that he attended the funeral of at least one policeman killed in action and staged a benefit performance for the widow of another. Ruby regarded several officers as personal friends, and others had worked for him. Finally, at least one policeman regularly dated, and eventually married, one of the carousel's strippers. Underworld Ties from the time that Ruby arrived in Dallas in 1947, he was friendly with numerous underworld figures. One of his earliest Dallas acquaintances was Paul Roland Jones, who was convicted of attempting to bribe the sheriff of Dallas and engaging in the sale of narcotics. Joe Bonds, one of Ruby's partners in the Vegas club, had a criminal record. Ruby, who enjoyed card playing and horse racing, was friendly with several professional gamblers. In 1959, he visited Cuba at the invitation and expense of Louis McQuilly, a professional gambler. Alice Nichols reported that Ruby's refusal to give up gambling was one reason why she never seriously considered marrying him. When Sidney Sideband, a Dallas gambler, was arrested in Oklahoma City, his list of gambling acquaintances included Jack Ruby. And other friends of Ruby have been identified as gamblers. Finally, Two persons of questionable reliability have reported that Ruby's consent was necessary before gambling or narcotics operations could be launched in Dallas. Based on its evaluation of the record, however, the Commission believes that the evidence does not establish a significant link between Ruby and organized crime. Both state and federal officials have indicated that Ruby was not affiliated with organized criminal activity and numerous persons have reported that Ruby was not connected with such activity. Travels Despite reports that Ruby visited Havana, Las Vegas, New York, Chicago, Honolulu, and Mexican border towns, most of his time subsequent to 1947 was spent in Dallas. Some of his travels, including his efforts in behalf of Little Daddy Nelson and his visit to New Orleans in June 1963 have been discussed. Ruby stated that he went to Chicago in 1952, in 1958 when his father died, and in August 1963 when he met members of his family at O'Hare International Airport while en route from New York to Dallas. His August trip to New York motivated by his difficulties with the American Guild of Variety Artists and his desire to obtain talent, has been completely established by hotel records. Early in 1963 Ruby also traveled to Wichita, Kens because of his interest in stripper Gall Raven, and on May 25, 1963, he apparently registered in an Oklahoma motel. Although Ruby denies being in Las Vegas after 1937, there are unsupported rumors that he was in that city in late 1962, and the early part of November 1963. Reports that he was in Las Vegas during the weekend prior to the assassination appear similarly unfounded. There is some uncertainty about Ruby's trip to Havana. Cuba, in 1959. The evidence indicates that he accepted an invitation from gambler Louis J. McQuilly, who subsequently became a violent anti-castroid, to visit Havana at McQuilly's expense. Ruby apparently met McQuilly in about 1950, when McQuilly operated a Dallas nightclub. McQuilly, whom Ruby said he idolized, supervised gambling activities at Havana's Tropicana Hotel in 1959 and later was employed in a managerial capacity in a Las Vegas gambling establishment. 
Ruby testified that he went to Havana for eight days in August 1959 and left because he was not interested in its gambling activities. McQuilly corroborated this story except that he stated only that Ruby visited Havana sometime in 1959. Three Chicagoans reported seeing Ruby in Havana during the Labor Day weekend in 1959. Meyer Panitz, an acquaintance of McQuilly, reported that when he met Ruby in Miami during the summer of 1959 Ruby stated that he was returning from a pleasure trip to Cuba. The theory that the trip to Havana had conspiratorial implications is discussed in Chapter VI. There is no reliable evidence that Ruby went to Havana subsequent to September 1959. Although Ruby denied ever being in Hawaii, there is some evidence that during the summer of 1961 he was in Honolulu seeking dancing talent. While it is unlikely that Ruby would forget a trip to Honolulu in 1961, there is no other indication that such a trip, if it occurred, had any sinister motives. Character and Interests Family Relationships As mentioned previously, Eva Grant was the only member of the family living in Dallas when Ruby returned to that city in late 1947. In 1948, she returned to the West Coast, visiting Dallas sporadically. Until 1959, when she assumed management of the Vegas. Despite their recurring arguments, during which they sometimes came to blows, Ruby was closer to Eva than any of his brothers or sisters. In the summer of 1963, Eva complained bitterly to Ruby because he gave a friend about $800 instead of paying Vegas club bills. Eva, citing her poor health he stated that she should be hospitalized. Ruby rejoined that he had provided her money to enter a hospital. He then shoved her, causing her to fall back about 8 feet and hurt her arm and shoulder. At this point Ruby insisted he wanted her to leave the Vegas club. Ruby frequently told Eva to submit to an operation and in early November 1963 she consented. She was hospitalized for a week, leaving about November 13. While she was in the hospital, Jack called Earl and Sam, requesting them to convey their concern to Eva. According to Eva, Jack visited her at the hospital two or three times a day. He kept in constant touch with her throughout the weekend of November 22. Sam Ruby moved to Dallas from Chicago in July 1955, after selling his interest in the Earl Products Company. His sons Esma and Eva's suggestion that he work as a builder in Dallas prompted the move. Apparently as a result of difficulties in collecting the $5,500 Sam loaned Jack in 1955 to pay federal excise taxes, Jack and Sam were never particularly close to each other. However, Sam entered into a partnership in an unsuccessful ice cream business with Jack's close friend, Ralph Paul. Jack visited Sam and his family occasionally, especially on Jewish holidays, and from time to time they spoke to each other by telephone. Jack had sporadic contacts with his brother Earl, who remained in Chicago until about 1960, when he moved to Detroit. The most successful of the brothers, Earl often gave Jack business advice and capital. He estimated, perhaps conservatively, that, when arrested, Jack owed him $15,000. The evidence also indicates that Jack borrowed at least $1,000, and probably more, from his sister Marion in Chicago. Social Relationships There have been statements that Ruby was a homosexual. The available evidence does not support the allegation. There is no evidence of homosexuality on his part. Ruby did not frequent known gathering places for homosexuals, many of the reports were inherently suspect or based upon questionable or inaccurate premises, and Ruby and most of his associates and employees denied the charge. All the allegations were based on hearsay or derived from Ruby's lisp or a feeling that Ruby was a sissy, seemed weird, acted effeminately, and sometimes spoke in a high-pitched voice when angry. Some proceeded upon the erroneous theory that Ruby did not date women. For the better part of 11 years, Ruby dated Mrs. Alice Reeves Nichols, a blonde divorcee, four years younger than he. Mrs. Nichols, secretary to a Dallas Life Insurance Company executive, testified that she saw Ruby twice a week between 1948 and 1956, and once a week from then until about 1959. Ruby discussed marriage with Mrs. Nichols, 
but Mrs. Nichols stated that while dating Ruby she was seeing other men and he was taking out other women. Although there are sharply conflicting reports about whether Ruby dated women who worked for him, the record indicates that Ruby sought and enjoyed feminine company. Affection for Dogs Ruby was extremely fond of dogs. Numerous persons stated that he was constantly accompanied by several of the dogs he owned. Testimony at Ruby's trial in March 1964 indicated that he referred to his dogs as his children. He also became extremely incensed when he witnessed the maltreatment of any of his dogs. Religious Interests Reared in the Jewish faith, Jack Ruby was not especially devout. Rabbi Hillel Silverman, whose conservative temple Ruby favored, reported that when Ruby's father died in 1958, Ruby came to services twice daily for the prescribed period of 11 months to recite the traditional memorial prayer. Ruby normally attended services only on the Jewish High Truly Days and he was quite unfamiliar with the Hebrew language. Ruby was apparently somewhat sensitive to his identity as a Jew. He forbade his comedians to tell stories directed at Jews or Jewish practices and, on several occasions after 1947, he fought with persons making derogatory remarks about his ethnic origins. The evidence also indicates that he was deeply upset that an advertisement insulting President Kennedy appeared above a Jewish-sounding name. Physical Activities and Violence While in Dallas, Ruby continued attempts to keep in excellent physical condition. He frequently exercised at the YMCA, the carousel, and his apartment, where he maintained a set of weights. Ruby was extremely concerned about his weight and health, including his baldness, and about his appearance in general. Ruby's concern for his physical well-being was partially motivated by practical considerations, for he was his own unofficial club bouncer. On about 15 occasions since 1950, he beat with his fists, pistol-whipped, or blackjack patrons who became unruly. At other times, he ejected troublesome customers without a beating, in many instances, justifiably. However, many people stated that he employed more force than necessary, particularly because he often ended a fracas by throwing his victim down the stairs of the carousel. Besides acting as a bouncer, Ruby on numerous other occasions severely beat people who were not club patrons, usually employing only his fists. Several of these episodes have been discussed in connection with Ruby's relationship with his employees. In 1951, Ruby attacked a man who had called him a kite Jew and knocked out a tooth. At about that time Ruby is also reported to have knocked a man down from behind and then to have kicked him in the face. In about 1958, Ruby disarmed a man who had drawn a gun on him at the Vegas, beat him almost to death, put the gun back in the man's pocket, and threw him down the stairs. In 1958, Ruby reportedly knocked down a man at the Vegas who was 6'3 tall and weighed 230 pounds. Ruby was approximately 5'9 tall and weighed about 175 pounds. Ruby then made the man, who had slapped his date, crawl out of the club. In a fight at the Vegas, reportedly witnessed by a policeman, Ruby severely beat a heavyweight boxer who had threatened him. During 1962, Several violent episodes occurred. Ruby beat a man who refused to pay admission or leave and then shoved him down the stairs. He jostled a woman down the stairs of the carousel and struck her escort, who was much smaller than he. On one occasion, Ruby picked up a man who was arguing with his date, knocked him to the floor, cursed him, and then removed him from the Vegas. When a cab driver entered the carousel and inquired about a patron who had neglected to pay his fare, Ruby struck the cab driver. In February 1963, Ruby badly beat Don Tabon, who had made some remarks about Ruby's lady companion, injuring Tabon's eye. Ruby was acquitted of a charge of assault and Tabon sought no monetary relief because he believed Ruby financially incapable of satisfying any resulting judgment. A doctor who went to the carousel several times between August and November 1963, stated that on each occasion Ruby ejected someone from the club. Buddy Terman, a prizefighter and Ruby's friend, stated that Ruby picked his shots. According to Terman, a bouncer at the Vegas for about a year, Ruby's victim was frequently drunk, female, or otherwise incapable of successfully resisting Ruby's attack. The evidence indicates that, 
Unlike his youthful escapades, Ruby was often malicious. He frequently felt contrite, however, when his anger had passed or when his victim was an old acquaintance, and he would seek to make amends for his violent temper. With two exceptions, there is no evidence that Ruby settled disputes with firearms. Shortly before Joe Bond's conviction in 1954, Ruby is reported to have chased Bonds with a pistol. And, Larry Crawford reported that about a week before the assassination, Ruby told him to get Ruby's gun so that an AGVA official and former employee, Earl Norman, could be ejected. Although Ruby did not often use his gun, it was frequently accessible when he was carrying large amounts of money. Generosity to friends and the need for recognition. While Ruby often flared up and acted aggressively, he seemed to calm down or forget his anger quickly, and there is also a great deal of evidence that he was extremely generous to his friends. He loaned money to them and apparently cared little whether the loans would be repaid. He was quick to offer employment to persons desperately in need of a job and he lent considerable aid to persons seeking work elsewhere. Moreover, when friends or new acquaintances had no roof over their heads, Ruby's apartment was frequently theirs to share. Ruby's unusual generosity may be explained in part by his extremely emotional reaction to persons in distress, which may have resulted from his first-hand familiarity with poverty, and by his unusual craving to be recognized and relied upon. Many of Ruby's acquaintances described him as a publicity hound, gladhander, and name-dropper, one always seeking to be the center of attention. Apparently the egocentrism of his youth never left Ruby. Yet, frequently he sought reassurance from persons he admired. 